So I grew up in a in a kind of Christian background. Uh, so my mother was Catholic. The school I went to was Church of England. If there is there is a hell and there is a day of judgment, um, I don't want to get punished by God uh, for following the wrong religion or the wrong belief. That could have you know bad consequences. I don't want to get punished by God. Uh, for following if the there's wrong a purpose of life, and the purpose of life is for human beings then surely it should encompass every aspect of human life. I was aware of Islam and it seemed deceptively simple. It was only when after further investigation, after I went through a whole bunch of different other religions and beliefs and philosophies, um, I, I kind of bumped back into Islam. Islam, I, I actually tried to refute Islam as I tried to refute every other religion before that or belief or philosophy. And Islam just kept answering me back with even more profound answers. And so I, I had to adopt it. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Abdullah al andalusi Really, thank you for coming and accepting our invitation. We are very happy to have you with us. I want to start with who is Abdullah al andalusi and can you tell us briefly about your life? Okay, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu feekum for inviting me on. Um, who is Abdullah al andalusi Just a, another servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we all try to be. Uh, so, I was born in London, raised in London, UK. Uh, my family background is I'm kind of part Portuguese and part North African. So I grew up in the most in the Christian kind of Christian secular family background, and I kind of became Muslim at 14 years old. At about 18 or 19 years old, I got more involved in public um, da'wah, and eventually I ended up getting involved in public debates and discussions, giving lectures at universities, and kind of doing uh, videos and publishing articles and things like this. Uh, you were 14 when you converted to Islam, as you said. Can you take us back to those times? What was the reason that you start researching at such such a young age? The simple, a simple answer would say curiosity, uh, but also it was just simply I became aware of different religions. So I grew up in a, in a kind of Christian background. Uh, so my mother was Catholic. The school I went to was Church of England and they had mass and communion and all this stuff. I was taught Bible stories and like, like my fellow students were. Uh, but I asked the question after I became aware that there were different religions, I asked the question, um, how do I know that I'm following the white religion if I was born in uh, China, would I be uh, an atheist or a Buddhist? Uh, would I be um, a Hindu if I was born in somewhere in India? The accident of geography can't determine what the truth is. And, and there's different ideas going around. Well, I need to investigate for myself. And also, if there is, there is a hell and there is a day of judgment, um, I don't want to get punished by God uh, for following the wrong religion or the wrong belief that could have you know, bad consequences. So I wanted to investigate. And it's so about 10 years old. I decided to go to my local library, although I always liked going to library anyway. This is before the internet. This is when people used to go to libraries, if you, <laughs> if you remember those things. Yeah. And um, I used to read every book you can imagine, not just on current religions, but historical religions, historical philosophies. Um, yeah, you name it, I researched it from you know, ancient Egyptian concepts of, um, of life after death to uh, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, to even uh, kind of Western New Age spirituality and so on, uh, every kind of cult you can imagine. I researched everything. I thought I'm not going to assume that the size of a belief or a religion or a philosophy determines its truth. I'm just going to see, uh, you know, what these different ideas are. Is there any proof for it? Does it make sense? Um, are there any, any problems I can find in it, like contradictions or things like this? And if so, then it's not the truth. So I, I went through that gradual eliminating process. Did you start with Islam or Islam was the last religion to look at? You. I was aware of Islam and it seemed deceptively simple when I first saw it. I thought, oh, it's very simple. Maybe there's not much kind of uh, deep truth in it that, I, that I'm aware just by seeing the basics. Because you, you know, I was reading a book about different religions, so it just present Islam very basic, very simply. It was only when after further investigation, after I went through a whole bunch of different other religions and beliefs and philosophies, um, I, I kind of bumped back into Islam and I started to ask a question about this. It was something very, you might think very small, which is, uh, it talked about Islam, um, so Islam talked about women having hijab and as an obligation, I was like, well, why does Islam want women to wear hijab then? What's the point of this? So I thought about it and I thought about it. And I said, well, you know, it seems like in the West, you know, we see there is a lot of sexual politics going on in the workplace, sexual tension, and sexuality, they're becoming used for advertising commodities and goods and things like this. Society is becoming very sexualized. 
And it's leading to a lot of problems, relationship dysfunctions, uh, people leaving their partners, uh, unfaithfulness, a whole bunch of things. And when I looked at the, the Islamic concept of hijab, I was thinking, well, what's the point of this? And I say, well, what would be the purpose of it, do you think? And I thought, well, maybe it's because they want women to uh, look modest, uh, not show sexuality in public, and there's a hijab and jilbab and everything. So, oh, okay, so that means then Islam wants society to keep sexuality out of the public view, keep it for the private. Because you can't do anything with, it, with sexuality in the public. You're, you want to go to work, you want to go to, to university. Why is sexuality going to be distracting you? Why allow it to distract you in public? It's not fair. Uh, it, it causes issues you know, in society that I, I was aware of in the West growing up. So I said, oh, that makes sense. And then it struck me, which is, if there's a purpose of life, and the purpose of life is for human beings, then surely it should encompass every aspect of human life, not just once a week or you know, in Jummah or in uh, church on Sundays, but every part of the life, including society. So Islam seemed holistic and it seemed, well, if th there is a true religion of true belief, then that looks quite like it or close to it. And I started to ask more questions. I didn't embrace Islam just on that, but I asked more questions and I encountered more answers, which were just blew me away. And so eventually I saw that Islam, I, I actually tried to refute Islam as I tried to refute every other religion before that or belief or philosophy. And Islam just kept answering me back with even more profound answers. And so I, I had to adopt it. So you didn't have any prejudices about Islam, misconceptions about Islam before reading this? Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. We realize that 80% of our audience, including this video, are not subscribed to our channel. As you know, we are a non-profit organization and advertisements are disabled on our videos. Towards Eternity is not just a YouTube channel, but also a medrasa. Here we try to educate ourselves and the youth Islamically. So the only reason we are asking for this is to spread the truth. It may seem like a small act, but inshallah, it will help us reach millions of people. Now let's click the like and the subscribe buttons and let's together walk towards eternity. So you didn't have any prejudices about Islam, misconceptions about Islam before reading this? The prejudices I had was the common liberal and secular prejudices about religion. Religion doesn't talk about politics. Religion doesn't talk about society or economics or, or, or human problems. Religion is just a belief you have where you can pray for things that you want and, and maybe get them, or, or it makes you feel good perhaps if when you feel scared about things, but that was it. That's what the, that was the prejudice. This was early 90s. This is before 9-11, you know, before all this stuff. So it was the common prejudice against all religions that, I, that was imbibed into me, uh, inculcated into me rather, that I've had as a, as a liberal, as a secular liberal you know, person in, in a secular liberal society. So when I encountered Islam was so holistic, that's what shocked me because I was told that religion doesn't talk about those things. And uh, when I discovered it did, it made more sense that it would have talked about those things. It, it should talk about those things. So I think you, you went through this process of elimination, right? This can't be true, this can't be. So how did you decide that those other religions were not true? Sure, I mean, okay, this is between the age of 10 and 14. So I look at different religions and I ask a number of questions, which is, um, is there evidence for this? Is there proof? Uh, was it available to most human beings? Or is this a message that is brand new? Or is it, is it, has it always existed? So with, like, when it came with Christianity, the idea that you have a human being that comes down to earth and he's actually God apparently, and he dies even though God is, doesn't die. Um, and, that, that, and his sacrifice, you know, kind of forgives your sins even though you're still sinful afterwards uh, and you still have to repent. So those things didn't make sense to me when it comes to um, Christianity. Uh, when it comes to uh, Judaism, um, sure, it believes in monotheism, but it seemed very much restricted to this one particular uh, tribal nation of people throughout history. I, and you didn't see any explanation for other tribes or brown history or what other people should be doing and following. When you come with Buddhism, uh, human beings are basically born into the world and they reincarnate constantly until they reach enlightenment. And I say, okay, well, what's enlightenment? Well, enlightenment is when you know the purpose of life or you know some deep truth. And I say, well, you're saying the purpose of human beings is to be enlightened. And enlightened means to know your purpose, but then, but then I know my purpose. My purpose is to be enlightened. And it becomes a circular logic. Also, there's other questions like, if there's no God in Buddhism or God is not important in Buddhism, who set up the system of rebirths and was there a first human being? Because you can't have an infinite regress in the past of people being, re so what was your first soul, your first body that you were born into? And then where were you before that? They're not answered these questions in Buddhism. Hinduism believes in a similar idea, 
uh, to that, because Buddhism comes off from Hinduism. Mainstream idea of Hinduism believes that there is one God um, that uh, we come from, but we are we used to be part of God, and somehow God's can split into pieces, and these pieces are ignorant and powerless. So a part of God is ignorant and powerless, and that you go into re you 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 go into reincarnation, you get born, you die, you're born, you die, until you can find a way to get back to God. But you are a part of God. That doesn't make any sense at all whatsoever. So God can be split into the infinite, unlimited Creator. Is can be split into pieces, and these pieces are finite, yeah. and these pieces are are limited. It doesn't make sense. So these are kind of the process I was going through for many different religions and beliefs. Also, atheism was also one of the things in the list, right? So you eliminated that as well. Well, I mean, um, I followed the typical prejudice that science can answer all questions. So at one point, I mean, I, I've always been interested in science. I still am. Um, I've always got good grades whenever I did I did science or physics based subjects when going for university and so on and so forth. But the idea that I thought science could answer all questions was an assumption that was taught to me by the society that I was in. But science doesn't talk about what is beyond matter. It talks about how matter behaves, and that's it. So uh, how fast it goes, in, in how it operates, it doesn't talk about what ultimately it's made up of. It doesn't talk about where it comes from. It doesn't talk about you know the, where it's all going. It just talks about how matter behaves. And then scientists either try to extrapolate saying that, oh, well, matter will always be the same way forever, or matter was always existing there forever. But that doesn't make sense because, again, infinite regress. If, the, if we, to get to this point in time, we had to wait an infinite amount of time to finish. Well, infinity doesn't finish. We'd never reach this point in time. So the fact that I'm right here sitting in front of you proves to me that God exists or there was a creator that initiated matter to move and to change and so on and so forth. So that's why I eliminate all these things. So after being convinced that Islam might, must be the truth, true religion, what steps did you take? What was your ultimate you know, uh, journey to accepting Islam? Can you tell us about the phases? Okay. As I was reading through the Quran, but also reading through uh, tafsir uh, explanations and commentary on the Quran, as well as all the different books I could find on Islam, um, it was uh, when I would find something that didn't make sense, I realized after thinking about it for ages and ages that it, that it wasn't that the text didn't make sense, but I had brought into it an assumption and the assumption was leading me to not understand it properly. Right. And so my process of going through the Quran began to purify me of my assumptions that I brought, my, my baggage that I brought into Islam, right? And so alhamdulillah, it, you know, my, my steps for encountering Islam and becoming a Muslim was really one of first, I was interested, I was intrigued that this sounds like something that could be true to the, the step of I adopt it as a hypothesis. I, so a hypothesis is something that you believe is the best explanation, but you, you're not... 100% certain, maybe there could be a better explanation, but from all the available evidence you have, it is the only, it's the best one. And after going through and my knowledge increasing more and more and more, and I started to ask questions like, well, what if there was a, let's say I was going to create a religion and I was going to take Islam as a basis, but I'm going to change something of it. Would it be just as good or better? And as I did that process, I realized that every time you make any, if you make any kind of change to Islam, it ends up with a contradiction or something, or something that doesn't make sense. And so I realized then that how Islam explains the universe, human existence, the existence of animals, the planets, everything, uh, uh, whether it's, it's pleasure and suffering and uh, whether you know, you are, the finite lifespan we have, all this, these things were answered in Islam to the point that there was actually no other possible answer that could answer all of this. So then I eventually came to the conclusion that Islam is the only possible explanation for reality. And then I had yaqeen, then I had absolute certainty so, in the deen of Islam. Uh, what was the last thing that you said, okay, now I'm going to become a Muslim tomorrow. What happened that you decided? Well, um, it was at 14 years old. Um, and that was when I, I adopted Islam, as you could say, a, a hypothesis, which is it's the best explanation that I know of. So as a, as a human being uh, who is searching for purpose, I'm obliged to, to follow the best explanation presented to me. And I don't see any contradictions in it, so there's no reason I should say no to it. I didn't know that you have to testify the shahada in a formal kind of way. I just thought it was something you just believe in. I said, okay, well, I believe this, and so, yeah. So my uh, shahada was simply going up to my, my mother and saying, uh, you know, oh, you know, mom, I think, uh, you know, I think I'll be a Muslim. 
<laughs> that was my shahada, basically. Um, and, you know, my mother, you know, from a secular background, uh, but a liberal secular background, um, religion wasn't so important. Uh, so she didn't really think it was uh, a big deal. She thought um, just a passing phase because, you know, parents with their children go through different phases and they, they try different things or different hobbies. So she thought this was just maybe a hobby I would do. I would do. After almost 30 years later, I think now she realizes yeah. that it's, it's a bit more than a hobby. <laughs> right. like yeah. yeah, yeah, so, so alhamdulillah. Uh, yeah. When you started preaching Islam, giving da'wah to people, were there anyone that became Muslim uh, around your circle, your family? Um, well, I mean, you know, uh, when I, as I started re-investigating Islam, I would always tell my mom about, about this. And um, obviously, you know, my father as well. And um, over time, I, alhamdulillah, uh, they saw changes in me. Uh, they, I became um, a better son uh, to them. I mean, I came from a secular liberal society and, you know, you had rebellious kids. Uh, and, it's, and it's different from the kind of rebellious kids you might think, because all kids are kind of rebellious in some way. But Western rebellious kids are much more disrespectful to their parents compared to, you know, other cultures and beliefs and so on and so forth. And so when I answered what my, my purpose in life was, I saw the errors of my ways and I saw that I increased in gratitude for what my parents did. But when my parents saw this, when they, when they see that their son is working harder, is politer, is m more well-behaved, I, mean, I wasn't perfect, but they saw a radical change in me. How can you hate that? Right? How can you fear that? I think ad adab conquers more than ideas do sometimes. People just see the change in your adab and akhlaq and that impresses them and inclines their heart towards you more or more effective than any, any hours of preaching you can do or speaking you can do. The one difficulty is it is hard for the parents to see their child teach them about life. Sure. So I, I, I changed your nappy, right? And now you're going to tell me about what I should be doing in life. So there was some of that, but eventually, like my father kind of rediscovered, I suppose you could say, Islam for himself. And for my mother, she became a kind of an, a nominal Muslim. It's not 100% perfect, you know, <laughs> you could say, because the thing is that she doesn't have many Muslims around her, right? And so all her friends or most of her friends are Catholic or secular and so on and so forth. So it's very hard because we're social creatures as human beings. You need to have encouragement. So, but alhamdulillah, she did say the shahada. Some people's stories are a bit more romantic, you could say. My one was more this gradual realization for both myself and eventually for my parents too. When you look at the Quran, what kind of book do you see from the perspective of your areas of interest? When you read the book of the Quran, it is unlike any book you've ever read, even when you see the translations. It doesn't seem like something a very capable human being could ever attain. Because usually people who are very good at writing books and very good at writing, they have these very limited structures they think information should fit into. Yeah, so chapters which only have a few points in them and then they move to the next chapter and move to the next chapter. The thing with the Quran is that one verse, its meaning can change depending on what question you ask. And you can read things that superficially don't seem connected but you feel in the back of your mind there is a structure beneath it. My advice to anyone reading the Quran is have a conversation with the Quran, not just passive reading. Ask questions. And you might think, well, I ask questions to a book, how can it answer me? But you'd be surprised how an ayah you think was very basic, um, didn't really have much uh, explanation, how it can answer questions you've never ever even contemplated or thought of. It's a book you can just keep on rereading again and again. Muslims today are more preoccupied with the sound of the Quran rather than the meaning of the Quran. Uh, there's even a hadith that talks about this. I mean, some people say that the hadith is da'if, but I don't know, it seems to predict things very few, uh, very interesting. Uh, it, it talked about the, the Muslims at the time the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, were more interested in the meaning of the, the Quran. But there'll come a time when Muslims will be more interested in the pronunciation of the Quran and, and the sound, but not the meaning so much. And I think that should be reversed. Ask questions of the Quran, have a discussion. Ask questions, why does the Quran use this word and not another word? What, the Quran is very precise. It's a very precise book. Why does it use the words it uses? Once you ask those questions, the Quran opens up even more to you. So that would be my, my advice. As a convert and a da'i, as a revert, what is the most common prejudice people have against Islam and how do you respond to it? The problem is that depends on, on which society you're, you're yeah. speaking of. 
So now after 9-11 in the West, the perception is that Islam is uh, violent and it's barbaric and it has punishments which are barbaric and it restricts all kinds of things and it restricts women and it restricts uh, being quote unquote free, whatever that means. Now, before 9-11, the perspective of Islam was that Islam was just uh, a religion and re all religions are kind of based in the past and they don't talk about modern day problems. Yeah. That's a very common misconception yeah. and it's one that even is in the Muslim world today. After colonialism, uh, the, the Western education systems or even influence, Muslims themselves have that misconception about Islam. They think Islam is something based in the past and it can't answer modern problems. Uh, Islam can answer problems, modern day problems, better than the solution that the West can pr bring. But we don't realize it. We think that it's just, uh, it's just about uh, praying five times a day. It's just about going to Jummah. It's just about Tajweed, your pron pronunciation of the Quran. Islam is much more than that. It is a full way of life. We see some people who, despite seeing clear evidences, don't become Muslim. What is the reason behind this, do you think? Well, I, I, I'll say there's two categories of people who resist Islam. One of those is obviously, you might, you might call them, they have emotional reasons, so they are already invested. It's called the sunken cost fallacy, there we go. It's where you invest, you've invested so much of your time, effort, your life, your, uh, your hopes and your dreams into something false that you don't want to give up because you've already invested uh, so much. You want to keep on investing. The second kind of people, and those are people I'm interested in, they are those who, they have assumptions, and those assumptions blind them from actually seeing the truth of Islam. People might assume, they say, there's so many different religions, uh, there's so many different uh, ideas of God, so they must all be wrong, right? That's an assumption, and it's, quite, it's a quite common one amongst many atheists and so on. But I could simply point to them and say, okay, in the past, there were so many theories about what the sun was, yeah? Uh, was it a flat disk? Is it an upturned bowl, with a bowl, a bowl of fire, um, or is it a sphere? Oh. Could someone say, well, there's so many different you know, uh, theories about the sun, that the sun doesn't exist. Say, no, one of them's right, the rest are wrong. Just because there's different ideas doesn't mean they're all wrong, yeah? So that's an assumption. So in Islam, we don't say that every word for God, for, for one God, in every culture for our civilization is false. We simply say that not all ideas of the divine are true if you believe in three in one, or you believe that God has split into parts, or, or there's multiple gods, yeah? or that God has a family. Those is, that's false. But if you believe in one God, whatever you want to call him throughout history, you want to call him uh, uh, Eloh, uh, which is, uh, or Allah, you want to call him Dios, Deus, or Tanri, right? This is all, it's the same word. You're, you're describing the same thing in, a different, lang in different languages. So um, that was an example of an assumption that people hold that gives us a, a roadblock. And so when you, we encounter atheists, deists, um, or people of different religions, those who are sincere amongst them, uh, the only thing that stops them from becoming Muslim is their assumptions. So inshallah, the, the work of the da'i is to destroy their assumptions. And then what does the shahada do? The shahada starts out with a negation first. It says, la ilaha, right? So there's no, all these idols, all these humans, statues, pieces of wood, all these things, uh, whether it's volcanoes you worship or the sun you worship or the moon you worship, all these are false idols, right? Uh, the, all these gods are false, except the one God, which is beyond creation. How did you find strength in those times? Where did you find strength when you were by yourself and no one around you was Muslim? One of the biggest questions I find Muslims, uh, who are people who are born into Muslim families in the Muslim world today is they ask about being strong on your deen or if you're not publicly manifesting your deen or if you're not calling to it, it's because you maybe are, are, are have a weakness or you have a struggle in yourself, which is, is hard to reconcile. For me, I always found that strange. If you understand that your purpose of life is something, it's following this deen, that you, there's a creator, he made you, uh, there is no other meaning in life except obeying him, following him, what he says, how is his guidance. Then it's pointless to do anything else. Because if I'm trying to uh, follow my parents or follow society, but these things are going to pass away, they are not my God, they didn't create me. So there's no point. When I find Muslims are preoccupied with these things, it, it, it really baffles me um, because uh, I came in with the assumption, and many reverts and converts do, 
It's not just me. Ask any convert and revert, they'll say they are shocked when they see the Muslim world because for them, they knew what life was like before guidance. That when they had guidance, guidance wasn't just simply, oh, here's what to do. It's this is the only meaning for human existence. Humans who have access to this, who now know it, follow anything else out. It would be, it would be pointless. Say someone got, went for a job interview right, in, a, in a corporate law office or whatever. Uh, uh, they came with a suit uh, and they, they did very well in the, job office, in the interview. They got the job uh, and they're going to earn lots of money and there's lots of respect. And they come in and then they start, let's say, playing football on the, in the office and, and they don't do anything else. You're like, uh, you're meant to be doing this job. here. You're, you're here to work and do this job. Why are you playing football in the office? That's the equivalent of Muslims who they have this purpose of life, but they are preoccupied with these childish things which don't have any meaning, like national honor or patriotism or nationalism or their family honor or just making money or following popular culture. These things have no meaning though. Why are you following this? There's no point to this. When you die on following these false idols, your life would have been meaningless. So asking me about my strength, I don't think you needed much, much strength. It's just, there's just pointless to do anything else other than implement the deen of Islam in everything. If you had a chance to speak to all the non-Muslims in the world, what would you like to say to them if you have just one minute? I, I think I would say the same thing I'd say, I'd want to also say to Muslims in the world, which is uh, don't blindly believe what you've been taught by your parents, your culture, your society. Question it for yourself. How do you know what you're following is true? How do you know that all the things that you've been taught are true about everything? And I don't just mean about questions of science or what have you, which of course we should we ask questions anyway. It's about what you should and shouldn't do. What is your life for? Ask questions about this. How do you know that what you've been taught is true? And if you do know, if you, if you investigate it um, and you discover the truth, why don't you implement it in all areas of your life? So ask questions and don't blindly follow.